Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. Tonight, we finish our discussion on the new dairy NRC with two legends in the industry. Tonight's episode will have a dual purpose. We'll have an in-depth conversation about the macro minerals, trace minerals, and vitamins chapters, but then we'll also use this as a series wrap up and we'll discuss a little bit about the history and the future of the Dairy NRC and implications that it may have for the industry. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell, one of your hosts here tonight at the Real Science Exchange. I'm happy to welcome Dr. Bill Weiss once again. Bill, you're becoming uh, quite a frequent guest here at the Exchange and we, we appreciate that. Uh, Bill presented the vitamins and minerals chapters previews on the Real Science lecture series uh, a few weeks ago. Bill's also spent several uh, decades researching vitamins and minerals, and he also served as vice chair on the new Dairy NRC committee, along with his guest tonight, Dr. Rich Erdman. Uh, Dr. Weiss, welcome back to the exchange. And I, I know you know the drill, so well, what are you drinking tonight? And then after that, can you give us a kind of a brief overview of the process that you used in creating the vitamins and mineral chapter for the uh, new NRC? Yeah, well, th thanks, Scott. It's, it's good to be back. Tonight's beer is a, I try to stay local. It's a Wiedemann's Bohemian Special Brew. Wiedemann's, oh I haven't heard that in years. That's <laughs> awesome. They, they quit and then they open back up. So I guess it's been open again. The new Wiedemann's has been back about five years. And it's, That's it's awesome. actually wow. quite tasty. It's, like a it's, it's, yeah. it's been right, a long time know. since I've had one. It's, I it's, drank it's, that in school. Yeah. <laughs> it's not as good as Tui's, but it's good. Close. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Tonight, uh, well, you know, with minerals and vitamins, that's one of the more challenging areas of NRC. One is just not a ton of data. You know, we, we can't do these sophisticated statistical analysis they could do for energy and protein and growth. We just don't have enough data to uh, to look at intake of minerals against responses. So it's it's a challenge on that way. We have to do a lot of extrapolation. You know, a lot of these studies, well, especially vitamins, there's the control with no supplement and then they feed some level. And you know where that response happens, it might happen right where they pick, or it might be better doubling it, or it might be just as good as they cut it in half. We just don't know. And another big challenge with this, or I guess, I don't know if challenge is the right word, but you know, a lot of software comes up with their own energy and protein systems. But a lot of them, I'm going to say most of them, use NRC minerals and vitamins. That they take these equations and put them into their software. So it's a, a big responsibility to you because a lot of people are going to be using these, even if they don't think they're using them. They really are. So yeah. it's it's difficult, but it's also very important. So yeah, good. Thank you for that, Bill. We mentioned your your guest that you brought with you earlier, uh, Dr. Rich Erdman. Would you uh, mind introducing him? Okay, no, happy to. Um, especially since OSU beat Maryland today, it was a very good game. <laughs> More than a beating. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. I, I was being polite. Rich Erdman served as uh, co-chair of the the NRC. Um, he served also. The reason they picked him for this, he was on the 2001 committee as well. Uh, he's been at Maryland. I, I can't tell you how long he's been. As, I met him. He probably doesn't remember this, but I actually met him when I was in graduate school. Really? Yep. I was. I was, went out to Beltsville and and uh, to see um, Waldo, Dr. Waldo, and, oh, yeah. and and you you were there, and I met you. So. Yeah. So I've known you a long time. You've retired a few years ago from from Maryland. Yeah. Um, now he's just enjoying retirement as he works on NRC. But he's he's done tremendous research in energy, um, body composition, a lot of mineral work, especially the macro, some some uh, vitamin work, especially more water solubles. But he's one of these people that have a broad area of expertise. He's not today. A lot of people get very very specialized. But yeah. Rich is one that knows a lot about a lot of things. So I'm, I'm glad he could join us tonight. Yeah, we are as well. It's it's an honor, Rich, to have you here joining us tonight. Can you uh, kind of explain how you got involved with the uh, this Dairy NRC? And I think kind of Bill just said that it was because you were involved with the first one. So maybe tell us how you got on the first one. And then how long have you been working on this eighth revised edition? Forever. <laughs> <laughs> It's a I was hoping you would ask that last question. First committee, we started when in 
Was it 97? Uh, yeah, for 2001. Yeah, for 2001 version. I mean, I, you know, the way people are selected for the committee is they, they get nominated. So somebody, now somebody nominated me, I have no idea. Yeah, I didn't nominate myself. So I, my first real dealings with Bill were like, you know, in terms of working with him directly was on that committee. Um, of course, I've known him for a longer period than that. I, when the new one was formed, we were asked to serve as co chairs on, on that committee. I mean, you know, Bill actually works in, has worked in several areas also. Um, he has a lot of, a lot of general knowledge, a lot of background, um, and he has good connections both within, you know, within academia and also within industry. So pretty well known. All right, good. Thank you for that. Um, I also have the, uh, the pleasure to welcoming back my co-host, Dr. Clay Zimmerman. Clay, you drinking anything delicious tonight? I am enjoying some water tonight. <laughs> well, that's good. You need to stay hydrated, Clay. Anything yes. uh, uh, exciting that you're looking forward to in our discussion tonight? A lot, actually. I mean, the, the Discover conference was great. You two both need to be commended for the job you did. We're certainly losing a lot of people like you, you know, from, from the industry now with the broad backgrounds that you both bring. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion. So thank you both for joining us. Yeah. Scott, what are you drinking tonight? Well, Clay, tonight I'm switching it up. I'm drinking a beer like Bill is. I'm drinking a Stella. Rich, to get us started, can you give us a little history of the Dairy NRC? You know, how to get started, why did it get started, when did it get started, those kinds of things. And, and, and what was the intended, intended purpose uh, when it first began? It started... Um... Actually, in the 1940s, um, but it was part of the war effort to increase uh, food production uh, for the war. And of course, you had Europe was on, they were flat on their back after the war and developed requirements, and they were requirements set up for all the domestic uh, livestock species, including horses. Um, because they were important animals at that time. Well, the first ones were in 45 or 46. They had not, every animal species had come out at one time, but they were fairly close. They weren't very long. I think the first dairy, you know, she was, I don't know, 30 pages, um, something like that. A lot of effort spent on explaining nutrient deficiencies. It was supervised by the National Academy, and then um, over time, initially, they would have these about every five years, and it went that way, and then they changed from, originally they were called nutrient allowances, and then I think maybe after the second or third go around, they change the to different requirements. And so this addition is the eighth uh, addition of the different requirements of dairy cattle. You know, the intent was to convene a committee of experts. Um, and essentially, these are feeding standards that are used um, as a basis for feeding for cattle, not, not only in the U.S., but also worldwide. These are the most highly cited um, publications in terms of dairy cattle feeding by far. Very well. So kind of kind of following up on that, you said it transitioned from allowances to requirements. Bill, can we talk a little bit about um, requirements and how how are they determined today? One thing about this new book that's coming out is we actually define what we mean by requirement. And for for two, several issues, we just said this is a requirement, but we never said what a requirement was. So in theory, a requirement when we say say the calcium requirement is X, that means for a specific 
type of cow. This isn't for an average cow. It's for the a specific type of cow, so much body weight, so much milk. The average cow doing that needs this much calcium. That's what, so half the cows would need more. Half the cows would need less of the, again, it's a, not for all cows. It's the cows within that very specific uh, population. And the way we, we've gone very much toward factorial um, because that's, e e I think it's easier to quantify. So what we try to do is say the cow needs this much calcium to put in milk and the cow, cow needs this much calcium to put into her fetus, this much calcium if she's growing a little bit. And then there's these maintenance functions which are lost in, in feces or urine and the cow needs so much calcium to replace these, these inevitable losses. And then we just add them up and it's so many grams a day is how much she has to absorb. For again, the average cow, half the cows will need more than that. Um, and then we, do, we have to come up with how much calcium a cow can absorb under these conditions. And we divide the requirement by absorption to get how many grams you have to feed. So that's in theory how it works. And, and you'll, as we go through to, to tonight's discussion, that, that works pretty well for most macros. There's still a few exceptions, but this factorial approach probably isn't we're missing things i think for the traces and clearly for the it will not work for the vitamins at all yeah what's the difference between a requirement and adequate intake well it, let's it works best for vitamins like i said if you have an experience we did a lot of vitamin e study and we'd feed our classic experiment would be no supplemental vitamin e and a thousand units that's what we fed and we'd see nice health responses from a thousand units so we would say uh, adequate intakes a thousand units you would get improvements in health and it may not be you know you might get twice as good for 2000 or might work for 500 so it's really when you, you there's a lot of uncertainty on the actual number that's yeah. i think what we really tried to know is that you know we're not we know they need it you should feed what we call the adequate intake but we're not sure if that's exactly right I think that's a big improvement, even though the numbers, like you look at the vitamin E re requirement in 2001 is the same as the vitamin adequate intake in 2021. But again, it just makes the reader aware that there's some uncertainty associated with these numbers. Yeah, and that, and that really came from the National Academy of Medicine approach. Um, when they, they went from a system based on daily allowances to what they call dietary reference intakes. And so you went in that DRI system to have um, one of the categories is an estimated average requirement. That's what, when we say requirement, that's what we mean. And then they also have um, a DRI um, and that would be the requirement plus two standard deviations around the requirement, and then they have adequate intake where they can't really define what the average requirement is. You know, there's not enough data to precisely estimate that, um, or they don't have an estimate of the variation in the requirement. So when we have, when we say requirement, we give the average requirement, but almost always, we also have indexes of variation around that requirement. We, you know, even in the human system, for a lot of the minerals, they don't have a standard deviation. They no. really don't. And they, they just take the variance for energy metabolism, which is 20% CV at 20, and that's their... Yeah. Their safety factor is basically 20% above the estimated average requirement. That's what they say you should shoot for. And I think that's a good idea for dairy too, but that's not included in the NRC. It's the, we have no safety factors. So the user has to, I think in many cases should feed more than NRC just because of the normal population or normal distribution. They need to be reasonable and the amount of minerals tend to be overfed quite a bit. Yeah. I, I would say that, from many of the research, that's correct, but things like energy and protein that need overfeeding, but for energy, it will be a disaster. Um, you know, because you have 
health implications from that. No. Uh, and protein is just too expensive no. No. to do that. No. Whereas for certainly for the micro and uh, minerals and uh, vitamins, um, you're, you're not talking about as much cost no. associated with that. Um, but I think the main thing is for people to realize that that number, when you say adequate intake, that's that's our best estimate. We, it's not precisely defined. Gentlemen, I'm curious, uh, talking about uh, dietary requirements, are, are there, do you guys have a list of nutrients for which there is a biological requirement, but you just don't have the data to be able to put an NRC number on it? And just curious if, if you have that list, is that something you plan to pass on to the next okay. committee? Yeah, there, there's a lot of nutrients or maybe not nutrients that affect milk production, for example. But that doesn't mean you have to feed it. Just because you get more milk doesn't mean you have to feed it. But things like um, biotin is maybe not a dietary required nutrient because the rumen can make it, but it's the cow has to absorb biotin and it, it often increases milk. So that would be one that maybe we need to, we need well, to get biotin into this. We need to be able to estimate synthesis and rumen destruction and all that, which is not easy. Chromium is one that very often they respond, but how much chromium does a cow need? I have no idea because we don't know basal concentrations. Choline, you could choline could fit in that situation, and uh, maybe niacin. So there's a lot that again, they're they're new. We know they're nutrients, but we ha really don't know if you have to feed it or supplement it. And if you if we have no idea on how much to supplement, I, I we we can in good conscience say this is the requirement because obviously in a lot of cases cows don't need it because there's enough basil. Cobalt and and uh, sulfur. I mean. Sulfur is simply a rumen requirement. Um, that's, that's all it is. You know, cobalt um, is for making vitamin B12. Um, I mean, the cow per se doesn't have a need for cobalt, um, but it needs it, um, you know, to make, to make B12. So, you know, so there are certain nutrients also they're not necessarily needed by the cow itself, but rather for good room function or for, for other reasons than, than, you know, being a requirement um, for metabolism. The, or the DCAD can fit in well, well into that as well. Yeah. You know, we get nice responses to increasing DCAD, but they don't you don't have to do that to still get milk production or high milk production, but that, that was these So macros would fit into that category as well. Some macros. Yeah. And I think magnesium fits, especially in the, the pre-fresh cow on risk for hypocalcemia. We can't figure out why if we use the factorial system. We'll come nowhere close to what meta analysis says you should feed for magnesium in a pre-fresh cow. We can come nowhere close to that. So there, there's some other functions. We don't know what's going on or, use of the magnesium but we just don't know so so which response variables you know as a committee which response variables are you looking at to to come up with with the requirements are adequate in i'll just start and then i'll turn over rich but again remember we for most of the macros it's factorial we just add up we, things we can measure like milk calcium we can measure that so just an adding up of all these things for the traces we tried to do that for some. Uh, well, what cobalt, we were talking about that. That we we used liver B12 concentrations as a response. Uh, homo cyst is a serine, homo serine. So there's things, metabolic responses that we could use. So for some, it might have been plat for vitamins, might have been plasma levels, but it's some of these, it's that's one of the hardest things is finding a, a good response variable. I think for things like energy and protein. And, you know, the amino acids, um, probably not as well, but we're doing better. Um, you simply uh, identify the, the losses that occur, you know, think what, what's needed to maintain the animal, uh, what's needed for 
but you force me into the growth of milk production. You add them up and then you take, you have a pretty good idea of availability from the diet and that's, that's how you, you come up with them. Um, <clears throat> but I think what the problem is is that that doesn't work well and we're talking about, you know, we're talking about the vitamins and trace minerals and, and some of the macros. When you don't have a good index of availability, that's when it gets harder to define a requirement. So, um, you know, that, that, that would be, the, you know, I, I think I made a statement at the, at the uh, Discover Conference that things that, nutrients that have high availability, um, generally you have free uncertainty on the requirements. Whereas things that you have uncertainty about the availability or they're low, those you have much lower uncertainty as far as what the animal actually needs. Yep. And and so it just so happens that of all the nutrients, the microbes yep. and the vitamins, those are the ones who have less certainty on, on availability. Yep. And so far, you can't really define the requirements as well. So. And, you know, some, some of them, a lot of the macros are 50% or more available. Yeah. But some of these micros are less than 1% available. And so, you know, if you go from 5.5% available to 1%, I, I don't even know if we could measure that difference experimentally, yeah. but that, that would double, or in this case, half, the dietary requirement and, and we can't even measure that when the denominator has a really small number a small change makes a huge effect on diet requirements yeah yeah it makes perfect sense uh talking about macro minerals uh bill perhaps this question is for you what are some of the biggest changes that uh, took place in the macro mineral chapter actually i'm gonna let rich did a lot of the work on macro so i'm gonna let okay. him address and then i might follow up on a few things but he he Perfect. was responsible so he can be blamed for most of that so <laughs> all right <laughs> when you on the election election i think we had a much better job yep. um we had good disability data on how set at varying levels of these uh, Sodium potassium and fluoride. And a few things that came out from that. One is availability of those those three um, minerals is exceedingly high. In two cases, sodium and potassium, we said that essentially they're 100%. And for fluoride, 92%, but I even wonder about that. So absorption is not a problem with those. Um, and then, you know, we know what, what's in the milk, much better definitions of the um, maintenance requirement, most of which, almost all of which is a middle of fecal requirement. And we have, I'd say, a very good handle on the amounts of the in those three elements as far as what is needed for various functions um, and the amount needed in the night. And I said, when availability is high, that just removes an air um, in terms of determining the requirement. We need to make some adjustments um, in the amounts of some of those in milk, most notably, sodium requirements were about 40% lower than the previous version, um, mainly because Cows have less, less mastitis than they used to, and fluoride also. So that, that, that was changed, but in terms of overall amounts of those, really not much different in terms of what you would see. And like I said, I don't think the numbers change much, but like you were saying, I think we're much more accurate on the biology of what's happening. Yeah. It's, it's, some of these differences are just, we fit, we fit much better on biology, which I guess theoretically would mean when you get more unusual diets, these equations should work better than the other ones or the older ones. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yes, what Rich brought up to me when we started this, 
you know, the easiest thing to measure is milk. It's easy to sample. We should have had great estimates on lactation requirements. And for a lot of minerals, those changed probably more than anything else. Yeah. Rich brought up mastitis for sodium and, and chloride. It changed a fair amount for calcium. Yeah. It changed for some trace minerals. It was by a factor of three or four. So a huge difference. And that really surprised me. I was saying, oh, those, we've known those for 50 years. We don't have to mess with them. But there was big yeah. changes on that. So. I found it in interesting how you estimated the milk calcium requirement. Can you explain that? Well, I mean, so I worked on that one. Um, the previous version was based on some estimates from Britain in the early 60s. And so fortunately there had been some <clears throat> pretty major studies done when they looked at bulk tank calcium levels in California. I think Billy Moore is also one of those. And where the calcium, um, amounts of calcium, they were based on breed only. And they were quite a bit higher than what you actually thought. I'm sorry. The, the measured amounts using her bulk tank in California was much lower for calcium than it had been using the previous NOC. <clears throat> and so we start, I started looking at the data and then, you know, okay, where is calcium and milk? Same as superphosphorus. Most of that is in associated with the calcium micelles. <clears throat> and so the calcium micelles um, are calcium phosphate salt and they're associated with casein, I'm uh, sorry, the casein myself. And so we started looking at that and basically kind of concluded that for both calcium and for phosphorus that milk protein was probably a much better predictor of calcium and also phosphorus need than, you know, green effects. And when you, when you incorporate in that, you found that most of the differences in green were due to differences in the protein content of the green. That that makes sense. Yep. So that that's why that was why that was changed. And we got rid of that over prediction that was in the in the last one. Um, I I remember reading the the uh, last NRC on the calcium amounts in in Holstein and Jersey milk, and they, they were like 1.2 to 1.4. I'm like, no, nah, that's not right. If, because if you buy milk in the store or you look at food composition, it's never that high. It's usually about one, one gram of calcium per liter of milk. That's pretty standard. It doesn't vary that much. So, so that's how that, that's how that one changed. You guys talked a little bit about uh, mineral bioavailability and the impact that that has on uh, the, the, the formulas. Is that because the, the source of the, the mineral that we're using? And if so, is there anything we can do to improve the bioavailability of those sources or should do? Well, source is a biggie. Um, the supplements, you know, the mineral supplements can vary a lot in availability. Feeds, we, we don't know how much, because, you know, how do you determine the availability of calcium and soybean meal when you have to feed it, in a, you know, a mixed diet? So on feeds, we I don't think we know nearly, nearly very much. And I, I really don't think that's important. We do need to do some availability of some, some different a variety of diets and see if there's much diet effects. But whether soybean meal calcium is more available than canola meal, I, I, that's not, not important. Um, the, the source is a biggie, uh, how they, um, and then I guess the other thing is, is especially if more for the micros, but some macros is the antagonist, you know, what else is in the diet that can affect availability, the uh, classics, potassium affecting magnesium, uh, sulfur affecting copper. So source, and then I'd say just diet composition would be two big ones. We have no idea on genetic, on cow variation, no idea whatsoever. 
Uh, any any uh, ground unplowed yet uh, then on the macro minerals before we transition over to the uh, trace mineral requirements? I think phosphorus, we changed the, we changed the system a little bit, but the amount, I'm not sure, Bill, how much that changed. Sorry. On, on average, it basically is the same. Yeah. But again, we're hoping to incorporate more sources of variation so that on stranger diets we can be more more accurate less overfeeding so and i think you'll notice on a lot of these things for an average diet an average cow didn't, didn't change a lot yeah um but it's what we think is with these better equations when you start feeding less average diets and less average cows it should work better so i i think with calcium there was quite a change oh, oh yeah. that, in availability. Um, for some reason, um, the last committee, they, they made some assumptions on, you know, the availability of these, let's say, <laughs> calcium supplements. Generally, it's, it's based around either calcium carbonate or uh, calcium chloride. And they, they just had those estimated too high. And so essentially what you saw is guys were, were assuming the average availability was the you know, 60%. Those went back down to 45, which is kind of where we were, I think, in the 89 version and the, and the previous ones. And this time we actually had data to evaluate um, to see, see how the availability of the diet in general compared to painting studies. And I think we're more close to the reality. So we're probably going to see a little bit more calcium than um, what was estimated. Now, on the other side, since no calcium is, it hasn't really declined. We just know it was lower than what they estimated. The requirements went down. So therefore, the amount of actual total calcium machining really hasn't changed all that much. The one macro that probably changed most was magnesium. Yeah. And I, and I think when the last NRC came out, that spurred a lot of research. So we had a ton of data they did not have in 2001. So I don't want to uh, yeah. denigrate that too much because we, we, we could do things they could not. And, so we have much better absorption coefficient data than they could could ever hope to get. And again, when you get better absorption data, you can better estimate these other things as well. So yeah. uh, that one is probably the biggest, and that went, could almost double in some cases of uh, the dietary requirement. But again, it's just because we we could do so much better a uh, job with because we had so much more data. Very well. Let's kind of transition over to trace minerals then. Uh, and Bill, did you write that chapter? Uh, we, again, and the whole committee is responsible for everything. Uh, <laughs> uh, for the good and the bad, but we were major contributors to that. But yeah. And it, it's, again, we tried to follow this factorial approach. And for, for copper and zinc, actually, there's enough data. I think we, we're pretty good on, on, on the factorial system. For manganese, iron, uh, selenium, iodine, it's it's an adequate intake, clearly. So again, we tried to look at the copper and milk, which again, in the, the 2001, they had a level, I think, like 0.15 milligrams per liter. And when we summarized the data, we could find it was down around 0.03 or 0.04. So a huge difference in, wow. in, in that. And I don't know where I couldn't dig up where the old one came from, but with the new new one, there's a lot of data, or I should say a fair amount of data. Um, and then the endogenous fecal. So those, those I, I actually call those requirements. I don't call those adequate intakes for copper and zinc. And we have decent, decent for trace minerals uh, absorption data. Um, and the, the copper, again, was one of these where they, and we, we did spend a lot of time in copper because there's, internationally is a major concern on copper. And so we, we worked hard on that. And for, again, for the average cow, it hardly changed, but because maintenance changed one way, um, absorption changed a little bit and milk changed a lot. So that at the end of the day, the numbers were almost identical, but for a high producing cow, it's a lot lower in 2021 because milk 
doesn't have as much copper as they thought. So that was down about, would be about 40% less for a cow milking 100 pounds using the new system compared to the old one. But dry cows went up a little bit because the maintenance went up. Um, and then zinc, it's a little higher. I can't remember, maybe 10%. But again, those two I, I consider requirements. The rest, you know, manganese, you could count on one hand how much manganese research has been done in the last 20 years. Uh, iron, even on about one finger probably is all you need. <laughs> um, selenium, there's a lot of data on selenium, but because of regulations and other issues, there's not a lot we could do on that. You know, we might come up with a different number, but you still got to obey the law. So um, the, the traces, again, we, it's easy to do the literature search because there's not a ton of data, but we did everything we could. And it, they're clearly better, even though the numbers, a lot of them, manganese did change a lot, but uh, the other ones you'll notice in, a, in on average didn't change a whole lot. But Bill, did the, did the committee address uh, maximum toler tolerable levels or, or minimum levels well we we and again this first chapter which rich wrote i strongly recommend everybody reading that because it, it discusses all this stuff upper limits or maximum tolerable however you want to define it and so we in in the chapter where we had adequate data we would say and i can't remember the numbers now but we would say there's data saying if you feed more than 30 milligrams per kilogram copper you increase the risk and and again i'm not swearing to that number but we tried to include uh, data on on maximum tolerable levels but like, like rich started this discussion is people got to remember there's variance on that number too and it's plus or minus it's not always you know on requirements everybody wants to overfeed and ignore the minus and on upper tolerable level they forget the minus so there's a, un, a lot of uncertainty on that number too so you want to stay well south of upper tolerable tolerable limits but we did we did address it as well as if we could if there was data what are the uh, kind of basis of changes what are some of the practical implications that a nutritionist might want to take into account it was a lot of work and like i feel like the numbers we have are a lot better as far as estimating the requirements but in the end i found myself you know, at the end of each section saying, well, you know, maintenance went up, milk production went, requirements went down, and in the end, they really haven't changed that much. I mean, that's kind of what it was for, you know, the, the many of the macros, um, except for magnesium and, and perhaps calcium. So I think mainly knowing why things are the way they are and having a bit of understanding where things are being lost um, rather than it's going to dramatically change how, you know, a practicing nutritionist would, would see cattle. Um, that, that's kind of, at least on the macro, that, that's what I walked away from. Um, I feel more confident in what we have. And, Absolutely more confident. And I think um, users ought to realize, you know, we have a lot more confidence in that number, which means they, they should have more confidence in the number yeah. and, and they should reduce the overfeeding. I mean, there when you don't have confidence, you of course have to overfeed and these are better. And and I feel, still think you have to very often overfeed, but not overfeed as much because and again, I think these new equations, it's when we get away from average. That's where I think these the difference is like, you know, if you had a 125, 130 pound cow, this lower lower milk calcium would make a big difference. Um, yeah. And so that so again, as we deviate from these averages, uh, I think you need to have more confidence in these numbers that would feed the average high producing cow. Mm -hmm. Good. So are, are there. Are there key changes, you know, on the trace mineral side that that nutritionists should be aware of? Well, the the biggest change in the number was manganese by far, but I think everyone, and again, there's very little data, and I 
think the old committee put a little bit too much emphasis on on one or two availability coefficients. And again, when when the availability coefficient is 0.5 percent, they used one that basically cuts the requirement in half. So it's a very small, like I said, an almost unmeasurable difference. And but I think most most nutritionists said we we can't go this low, and so the the new numbers will be i think closer to what people are are feeding and the yeah. the copper again there's i get when i was still working i'd get calls at least uh, once a week on excess copper not on inadequate but excess and so again i think these new numbers that the on average are going to be the same high producing cows will be lower and I think again, they'll, they'll, you know, I tell them how much I think they need, and I say they say, "Oh no, no, we can't go that low." And now I'm hoping they say, "Oh, I think maybe you, we can go that low." So, yeah, I, I think the only one I remember Homo, that got yeah. doubled. Yeah. And you know, to be honest with you, that was that change was based on some more southern Germany with growing cattle, but. The, that work was so well done. Yeah. They measured all the metabolites associated with B12 metabolism, and they sat at multiple feeding rates. Um, it was so clear that um, the, the freeze was quite one milligrams yeah. per kilogram. That and you know it's still a trace element. It's very inexpensive, um, but. I, I feel very, I mean, certainly, I think you've seen more cobalt than that, but I think a minimum of 0.2 is, yeah, yeah. is, is needed. So, um, there's others like, you know, some of these, like, I, I was on iodine, and oh my goodness, that, <laughs> all of that data is, goes back to, to uh, Bill Miller in Tennessee, and and Bill Hansford, um, this was done in the 50s and 60s, and that that is just wide open. Um, nobody really, I you know, I doubt that it's being underfed, but as far as a requirement, uh, yeah, yeah, it's just almost impossible to determine the amount. So, there, there are a lot of things like, for example, going back to calcium, the availability data for calcium is bad. Um, you know, there are tools now that we have that before the only way you can do it was using radioisotopes, and you can't do that anymore. But now you can use stable isotopes. So there's, there's a lot of opportunity there. I think for most of the race elements, there's opportunity to do it that way where you know where we didn't have it before um, just gotta, gotta, gotta get somebody that can sponsor it's expensive research but it, it can we have techniques now to do it we just gotta yeah get somebody who's willing to pay for it yeah do we have any uh, significant revelations uh, relative to vitamins in the new nasum again on um, we only have adequate intakes and we only have the fat solubles um, I do want to put a little plug in for the actual book, not just the software. The book has a lot of good, is an excellent reference, and there's a very good section on water-soluble vitamins, a good re lit review. So I'd encourage people to, you know, read the book, not just use the software. So we don't have requirements or adequate intakes for the water solubles, but functions, responses, all this is discussed in, in pretty good detail. On the Fat solubles, they, they were tweaked, not changed. You know, milk is a pretty good source of retinol. And these high, most of the studies were done back when cows were averaging maybe 70 pounds of milk. And so at, at 100 pounds, you got to start accounting for this retinol lost in milk. So that was added into the equation. So we account for that. So it's, a, it's not a factorial, but a pseudo factorial. Uh, vitamin E, the only new data on that was with pre-fresh cows on, on postpartum health. A lot of metritis data, a little bit of mastitis. So we bumped up a pre-fresh uh, requirement. And on vitamin D, the re we changed the, and the old NRC, and this goes back, I don't know how long, but it's always been calcium. 
you feed enough vitamin D to prevent rickets and maintain blood calcium, and that's all they needed. Yeah. And, and you know, with, especially with humans, you hear, you know, vitamin D can do almost anything. I don't know if it can do quite as much as people said, but it's well beyond calcium. And so we use the cutoff of, of based on a 25 hydroxy vitamin D maintaining. I think it was 30. Don't don't hold me to that number, but a certain plasma level of 25 hydroxy D and on studies that have been done said most cows fed the old NRC will meet that that minimum blood level, but a, a substantial number didn't. And so that we bumped that up a little bit again to so that adequate intake, most cows would maintain blood levels at at the 30 nanograms or whatever it was if you feed these new levels. So a tweak, tweaking more than anything, but still clearly adequate intakes, not requirements. Yeah. Bill wanted to say just kind of a follow up to your uh, uh, discussion about uh, reading the 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 dairy NRC. You can order your you can pre order your copy by going to balkan dot com slash real science, and get a twenty five percent discount. Just click on dairy NRC there. So just kind of a uh, there there's your way to get get the booklet and and the discount. I guess one before I forget here, I just want to mention this is for most nutrients, you know, basal ingredient supply counts. The copper in the corn counts and the, the calcium in the alfalfa count. Um, and people tend to forget that sometimes. But for certain, the vitamins, we don't count <laughs> because people don't measure their the beta carotene in plants and they don't measure the tocopherol. So we, we don't count that. Um, and for some of these traces, uh, cobalt, for example, we really don't count the cobalt in the, the feeds because we don't know how much is in there. So some of them selenium, we don't really count what's in the feed. So pay attention to that too. But in general, count what's in the, the base. That's in the adjusted for the absorption coefficient and so on. So it's total diet mineral. It's not just supplemental. Bill, do you find a difference in the bioavailability of the uh, minerals found in the, the, the plants versus the, the supplemented versions? From the data we have, I'd say it, mo it used to be when you talk to nutritionists, the stuff in the feed wasn't very good. The stuff in the supplements was good. And from the data I've been able to dig up, it's probably just the opposite. <laughs> A lot of this stuff in the feeds is relatively high. The stuff in the supplements still, still can, might be good, but it's not as good as the what's in the feeds. And a lot of this makes sense. And you know, it's like the calcium in a plant is is very soluble. It's been taken up by the roots and it's soluble. And the, the calcium in limestone isn't so soluble and magnesium. So some of this makes a lot of sense that the plants actually can be a pretty available source of, of, of mineral. Clay, any thoughts on this uh, area? Bill, I know you get this question a lot, but uh, what about uh, what about differences in increased mineral um, absorption by source? Well, it's, it's highly related to solubility. So the sulfates and chlorides are going to be better than the oxides. That the organics are the, the that's, you know, we, we, we can measure, I think, um, adequate, well, again, to measure the absorption of any of these trace minerals is very, very difficult. So uh, the commercial companies out there don't know. I'm going to say they do not know the actual absorption. They might have an, what we call, you know, relative absorption. So they compare a response to copper sulfate. Their, their product might double the liver copper compared to copper sulfate. So they say it's it's twice as available. And I think that's a reasonable thing, but you still don't know what the availability of the copper sulfate is. So it's twice of something, but you don't know what the something is. So there, there there's a lot of unknown. And for some of these minerals, we, we don't even know what to measure. Uh, to, so you can't even do relative availability. Manganese, what, what do you measure? I don't know. So you, that, that, that that's still a major, issue on a lot of these is just how available the stuff is because again it, it's not just measure what goes in the front end of the cow and what comes out the back end that doesn't doesn't answer the question so it's it's tough to measure 
Rich, any big areas that we've uh, left uncovered so far on uh, these three sections? Well, I, you know, we've talked about spent a lot of time on availability. That, I mean, if you're looking for the future, I think that that's an area we just really need a lot more specific data on supplements and on you know, on availability and feeds. Um, yeah, I remember having a discussion about calcium and, um, you know, how available was calcium in, let's say, a cereal grain. And, you know, you realize quickly that very little diet calcium comes from cereal grain. So it doesn't matter if you're off. But things that are major sources, um, you know, those are we're lacking, and the major sources are, for example, cal- on calcium, it would be your supplements, and maybe some of your protein supplements, you know, to go along with that. Um, and I and I think, I, again, we, we've talked about this a lot, but I think availability was probably the biggest challenge of, you know, going through all these minerals, um, that was where most of the uncertainty was. I think we're doing better. Um, but, you know, I, if, if I was a company, let's say, was selling a mineral supplement, having that availability data um, is really helpful. Um, and, you know, you may find out that <clears throat> you don't need to feed as much. Um, of an, a supplement that is maybe more expensive on a per weight basis, but much more available. Um, and so, <clears throat> but it, 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 time and time again, I think we, we accounted for the losses. I think we know pretty well how much is in milk, um, but that availability was we kept coming back to that. Um, and, you know, in the traces, I, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I, well, how, how do we know, you know, what that number is? Um, and then even for a diet, and then let alone a, a particular supplement. So that, that's kind of, kind of where I am. I mean, if I was working in, Let's say I want to work in middle, you know, say calcium metabolism. You know, I would be going back and working on that availability yep. aspect. Yep. That, that's what comes to mind. Rich, I know you've done a lot of work in the in the DCAD area. Uh, do you want to comment on DCAD and lactating cows? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> that was tough because. We set the requirements, that minimum requirement is the mineral, the minimum requirement for the individual components of the ECAN, namely um, sodium, potassium, and fluoride. However, I would not see that. Um, but here's a situation where you really have to look at the responses of the animal um, to different varying decad levels. And clearly, you know, if you look at the requirements, you would say using that system that includes sulfur, that um, you add up the requirements and you get about 180 uh, milligrams per kilo. I would never see that. I would see a minimum of 300. But our, our job was, we, we couldn't define DCAD per se, because it's all dependent on the amount of the individual elements and the amount of DCAD depends on what else is in the, in the diet. So I know that came up during the Discover uh, conference. I probably didn't answer it very well. Um, but, you know, we published uh, 
extensive meta analysis. Um, and you have two responses. One is below a certain level of ECAD, intake goes down. No question about that. Um, and above that, you'll get two responses. One is a slight increase in milk production, a much larger increase in milk fat content. Um, and so the things that you're facing your recommendation on is not the individual elements, but the response of the cow um, to that. Um, you know, a, a comment came up for the meeting about whether we should be feeding a higher decad diet during the summer than uh, during the winter. And that's another one I, I kind of wish I would have answered differently. My response is probably not. Um, you probably are not going to see a higher concentration. But the fact of the matter is, is that the amount you would see an elevated level would be the same in the winter as you would in the summer. I would not vary it um, accordingly. In reality, we really didn't have a specific ECAN requirement. I, I would simply go to the literature, there's a meta-analysis on, and look at the response, and determine how much we want to see based on the response. And if you feel like you're going to get a, a greater milk fat response, um, and milk fat is valuable, you're going to see more decal. If the decal, if the milk fat response is lower, um, and it's expensive, Probably Gentlemen, this is the uh, the final episode in our series of five uh, reviewing or previewing the the new dairy NRC. I'd like to kind of maybe put that behind us to kind of cast our gaze to the future. And so, as you look to the future, how do you see the new dairy NRC NASM evolving? You know, in another ten years, have a brand new, totally comprehensive uh, uh, document or Perhaps could we be taking a look at sections and updating them as needed? Uh, just, just kind of curious if you've given any of that some thought. And I just kind of threw out a couple of things there just to kind of spur your thinking of what I was kind of thinking through. It won't be 10 years. I know it's going to have to go longer than 10 years, hopefully not 20. But <laughs> and, <laughs> unless Rich wants to come back and share the next one, too. So. But no. You know, that we talked a lot about that at the end is should we just update what we think needs to be updated yeah and and that's not a bad idea but you know does that mean the next book we we have a lot more work on say energy and protein so the next book only has energy and protein and nothing on minerals and vitamins and that starts making what or do we just copy and paste the last mineral and vitamin say nothing was changed and do that um, I think some approach where they, it's more limited in scope is necessary. I, I do think it's too broad right now and takes too much time. So, and I know Rich, when he, when we started one of our first meetings, he kept emphasizing the point, remember, this is the revised edition. You don't have to rewrite everything. But yeah. every everybody did, though, so. Except, <laughs> except, except for <laughs> So it's just like that. I think we do have to limit the scope <laughs> on on what's new. It's because it just it you know this one was seven years. It's just too long. It just takes too long. So yeah, I you know looking back, I I can think about mistakes that we made primarily in limiting the scope. Um, and yeah, I mean I I kept emphasizing. You know, if a section is, is, you know, covers what real, what the available information is, use it. Um, you don't need to rewrite it. Um, and I, hardly anybody did that. Um, <clears throat> and that was, I felt made it more worse than it used to be. I also think that as many members looked at this and said, you know, we're only going to have one shot at this. 
and it might be another 20 years. And so they try, you know, they try to work in as much as they could uh, into this revision. And, you know, on the human side, what they do is they have chapters on individual nutrients. And they are not all seen at one time. They have separate writing committees, you know, for each section. And they they stagger them. And I think that's that's more probably more appropriate. I think the um, the new committee on uh, animal nutrition, um, NAMP, um, I think having that group functioning continuously uh, will, will be a big help. Um, but but at the thing, I think the biggest mistake that was made was not limiting the scope of, of what we're going to do. Um, so I mean, yeah, I'm I'm proud of the work that's amazing did. I'm not proud of how long it took. Um, and you know, I would I would blame myself uh, for for some of that. You know, when you I remember you know, that that first meeting we had in uh, at the National Academy building. And you and I were sitting up in front of the table, and I'm looking at all these people in front of me, and I, I'm telling myself, my God, these people are really smart. What am I doing here? You know, I mean, I I, I knew I, it was, was going to be okay. And so you have a tendency to kind of defer, you know, to their expertise, because not everyone has that expertise. And, you know, and looking back on it, I think we should have been a lot more firm. And we tried to be. Um, but some things just kind of rang out. And we didn't need, need to do that. I sometimes tell people, I'll front me dead by the time the next one comes <laughs> out. Hopefully not. Um, but certainly I won't have any involvement. Um, and uh, yeah, that if they ask me that, that's where we're going to do it next time. I, I really counsel them on limiting the scope of what they're going to do, taking cues, the most important things, yep. and things that haven't changed, but leave them alone. You know, this has been a, a U.S. government sponsored uh, initiative from its uh, very inception. And um, and then obviously driven by 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 U.S. Um, scientists, does it make sense ever to kind of um, open it up and, and and include somehow? You know, I know there's probably politics involved, but you know, kind of getting a, a more of an international flavor uh, involved in this is that something y'all have discussed? Well, we, we you know we had Helen Lapierre from Canada, so it is a international, at least North American. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know what the National Academy's rules and regulations are. I don't think they would in, prohibit that, but I don't, I don't know. That's their policy, so I don't know. But Yeah, I don't see a problem with that. I, um, I, I don't see a problem with it. It's, if this is a document that is supposed to represent the worldwide industry, you know, having a different perspective would be helpful. It also might make it more complicated to um, think more about how the communities meet and um, but you know, we didn't meet face to face that many times. Um, I don't know, four times? At, at the most. I don't even know if yeah. it's four. But... Then just a matter of timing, you know, when you have your meetings. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I don't see where there would be an objection, objection to, to doing that. Um, it, would, it would make things, you know, we, we, a lot of what we do is, is still very, um, 
data specific. You know, we we our our data is Holstein Jersey. We started bringing say Europeans, and now you have more breeds. Yeah, they're a grass based system. We're a corn silage out, so it also complicates it so much a, a bit more. So, yeah. Um, that that would also be an issue, and then you know there are other countries have their own systems too. But yeah. like I said there's a very good scientists around the world that could definitely contribute to this. Yeah, yeah. you know one final question I kind of wanted to dig into is you know during the the four previous podcasts and even this one we talked a little bit about gaps in funding, gaps in data. Um, you know what kind of advice would you give? Uh, the folks that follow you in terms of um, filling those gaps in funding specifically? How do we get the data that's needed to to fill some of those holes? Well, um, one, one issue I'm very concerned about as a retired scientist is, is who's coming up behind us. And you know, in the minerals area, there's some, some good young scientists, but not very many. And this is an area that you know there's 15 or so minerals that and you can't be an expert in all of them so that worries me is just who's going to actually do the research and then on on funding you know the the companies that make make organic minerals and other minerals have have sponsored a lot of research but of course it has to involve some of it has to involve their product and which i understand so i think the the usda needs to recognize minerals are important and and you know both from and right now we overfeed so maybe get some better ac data we can reduce environmental impact of these these metals um you know some of this animal product livers which are really high in copper can be toxic to humans so maybe look at that avenue um and then health and welfare you know start emphasizing some of this other stuff but uh, it's a lot of what is needed is not, I, mean, I, I think it's exciting, but it's, it's a lot of it's pretty standard research, but it's it's needed. And, and so I think some of this has to be at the federal level and uh, just because it is just across the board, it won't benefit any specific company. It'll benefit the entire, uh, both users and uh, both producers and users of dairy products. But it's a big issue. Yeah, Mike. My- my biggest concern is that so so many of the new faculty members that are coming in are have such highly specific areas yeah. of interest that they don't necessarily have see that big picture of how it all fits together. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm wondering where those people, particularly at universities, are going to come from. Um, they, you know, it's the motivation and the incentives for them are definitely not to be generalists, like, you know, Bill and myself. Um, we tend to focus on one specific area and so i i am you know i'm i'm worried about in that aspect um you know so i'm, I'm thinking to myself okay who are going to be people that you were if we were to replace you know bill myself and, you know most of the other people on the committee you know, that those areas of expertise and I can see some of them but I'm having a hard time. You know, like in the mineral area. Not not you know, not yeah, I'm not a hard time because there's not that many people working on it. Gentlemen, uh, this has been uh, quite a joy. I've enjoyed every moment of it and wish we could kind of go on forever, but uh, alas, we cannot. Yeah, we may need another round if we do that. Um, what I'd like to ask each of you to do is just kind of give us two key points uh, that, that the audience can take away from our discussion this, uh, this afternoon. And uh, Rich, why don't we start with you since you've got the microphone? I think for me, I, I've talked about this before, is that I, I have a lot more confidence when I look at the the mineral section 
you know, with the uh, macro and micro, I, I have more confidence in that what we have is right. Um, I'm not saying what we had before was wrong, but um, in, the, in the end, we're probably feeding a lot the same amount, but we kind of know why. Um, uh, I think we've done a much better job of certainly on the macro side of defining the requirements. So basically, it's more of, more of a confirmation thing. You know, what we were doing before that, you know, with some exception, um, was pretty good. Um, maybe it was good for the wrong reasons, but, you know, it hasn't really changed much. Um, and, you know, if someone came to me and asked me, well, in, in the macros, if you were going to pick a macro element or some macro elements to work on, you know, what would I do? I could tell them, you know, this is where, this is where we have some holes. Um, and we certainly have a lot less than we had 20 years ago. Um, I, you know, I guess one of the, you know, Bill, we talked earlier about whether we should stay with this as more nutrient um, basis uh, for the for the minerals. And, you know, I said, well, you know, we don't have the availability data, which is true. But <clears throat> we, I also, we also talked about this, and you know what, going back to him, just contents in the diet diet would be backwards and now I'm more convinced than ever that that would be yep. that would be a mistake but we're on the right track um, and we just we need to keep on it thank you Rich Clay any final comments yeah I guess uh, you know I thought the the end of the discussion there about the gaps that are out there right now i just uh really want to um you know to to all the young scientists that are out there grad students maybe undergrads you know give some give some thought to that that you know these are areas that uh where we where we need more research done and i i think back to when i was in graduate school and i asked one of my advisors uh he his graduate work was in in the amino acid area and i I said, why did you, why did you um, stop working in that area? He said, everybody was working in the amino acid yeah. area at the time. So he, he took on a different specialty and be, became, really became a, a world renowned expert in, in a little different topic area because of that. Yeah. Thanks for that, Clay. Bill, we're going to let you put the bow on this. <laughs> Well, with minerals and vitamins, there a lot we still don't know. And so, again, I'm going to plug the book. Um, and we don't get a commission on this, in case you're wondering, no. or, a, or a royalty. But we know a lot, but a lot of things we, we know we don't have a number. And so, you know, I really would encourage people to read the book. And it, I'm going to use magnesium as example. We know potassium antagonizes it. We had enough number. We've got an equation. We also know fat can antagonize it. We just don't know how much. We know uh, high RDP can antagonize. We just don't know how much. So if you read this, you start thinking, well, I've got these situations. I, I don't know exactly how much more I should feed, but I probably need to feed more. And on a lot of minerals, we went into stuff like that. So even though the software may not do anything about it, that doesn't mean we don't know anything about it, but the user has to has to read the book and make his own judgment. So I'd, it, it also points again, what, what Rich was saying, where there one, one charge we did have from NRC was to include stuff on what we what what is needed. So all, almost every chapter will have may not be a specific section, but it'll say we, we couldn't do this. There's not enough data. We encourage researchers to study this area. So I, again, I, I don't just think of this as software. Think of this as a, a very good up-to-date reference material where you can tweak diets individually based on what's what's in the text. So, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate that, Rich. It's great seeing you again. Thank you for uh, stopping by here at the Exchange, Clay. It's always good to yeah. see you, gentlemen. This has been long awaited, but uh, it was well worth the 
the, the time and it did not disappoint. Um, I also want to thank our loyal listeners for stopping by yet once again here to the exchange to spend some time with us. I'd like to remind our listeners that you can pre-order a copy of the new NRC book and receive a 25% discount by visiting balchem.com slash real science and click on the NRC series for a link and a discount code. If you like what you heard, please remember to drop us a five-star rating on the way out. Don't forget to request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt. You just need to like or subscribe to Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Our Real Science Lecture Series of webinars continues with the ruminant focus topics on the first Tuesday of every month. Visit balchem.com slash real science to see upcoming events and past topics. We hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange, where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. Mm-hmm.